Uh, I'm now joined by Mr. Tahir Khan, who's a consultant vascular surgeon and uh, the lead for the uh, deep penis intervention service at St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, Tahir, uh, tell us what happened to the patient that you treated uh, at St. Thomas's during the course of VO 2023. So uh, last year we had this uh, really young 25-year-old girl who uh, was quite active. She used to work in a zoo, had a really busy job, uh, was really involved in her career there as well. Uh, but she presented with a gradual onset of left lower limb swelling over a period of a few months. And then that uh, progressed on to tissue loss as well and associated with quite significant intolerable pain. And she was referred to her from a local vascular service, but she'd already had had input from the rheumatologist, the dermatologist, and the, neuro and the neurologists locally. Initial imaging had demonstrated that the arterial tree was absolutely fine, and there was no significant uh, superficial or deep venous reflux noted on duplex imaging. However, uh, cross-sectional imaging suggested both CT and uh, MR venography that there was a May Therner configuration of her vessels. And this is uh, her uh, MRV, which showed that the left common iliac uh, is quite uh, tightly compressed by the overlying right common iliac artery here. She also had a lymphocytogram, and that demonstrated that the transit of uh, lymph was much faster up the uh, left leg than it was up the right side. And then uh, at our last uh, VO meeting, she was uh, her May Therner stenosis was treated, and that was with a 14 millimeter caliber Aubrey venous stent. And this is the initial IBIS imaging, which shows the compression of the left common iliac vein with, by the overlying right common iliac artery. And post-denting, a nice wide caliber was achieved, and we can see the contrast flowing freely through that stent right there. Postoperatively, her pain was controlled. It then improved. She was able to tolerate compression at that stage. And then she was discharged on six weeks of therapeutic low molecular weight heparin, which in, at our center is Doltaparin. And thereafter, once a surveillance imaging had confirmed that the stents were patent, she was transitioned to a pixabat. And her tissue la loss went on to heal over the next two and a half months. And this is her six month uh, surveillance duplex, or most recent bit of imaging. And we can see that the stent is patent. Yes, there is a bit of sedimentation that one can see but that is relatively minor and is not causing any significant hemodynamic concern. And she's doing very well with regards to her tissue loss. However, her pain recurred uh, approximately four to six weeks after her uh, stenting. And she has been reviewed by the pain team as well, who have diagnosed her with complex regional pain syndrome and have listed her for a spinal cord simulator. So we've managed to get her uh, ulceration to heal and the swelling to come down quite significantly, but we, the, but the pain has remained an issue. And this suggests that there may, be, may have been an underlying multifactorial component to our pathology. Thank you, Taha. Um, uh, that was a lovely presentation of quite an unusual case, really, wasn't it? So uh, the reflections here are, you can keep the stent patent, but that doesn't always uh, help with the pain. So, um, you know, we have a lot of focus on an MDT team in managing these patients. What aspects of that do you think are important for anybody building a service or watching this to understand about how uh, it's a team that makes a difference in these cases? That's a really good point, uh, Steve. Uh, having an MDT is almost essential to deliver to delivering this service as as you have well established. Having that hematology input to, rec to help you recognize particularly for patients, not only for nibble lesions like this, but also for post-thrombotic syndrome and acute DVT patients, helping with the hematologist's help, recognizing any underlying thrombophilias, to help optimize the patient's outcome, treat those underlying thrombophilias, place any anticoagulation that needs to be instituted. The other real component of the MDT that is of great benefit is uh, we also have input from our interventional radiologists and our pain specialists as well, which are which are a real component and a real integral component of the MDT. 
they come together quite effectively in helping us optimize the patient's outcomes, both in terms of uh, helping us manage their post-operative discomfort that they may experience, because that is a component of the uh, underlying PTS pathology in particular that can often be difficult to manage. Uh, our interventional radiologists are quite essential when it comes to providing us uh, with one th one thing that's uh, their level of expertise and also their capacity in terms of managing the acute patients as well. So the MDT is an integral component of managing these patients. Yeah, and I think um, when you reflect on a case like this as well, we've learned these lessons yeah. from other areas where complex pain is a problem. Um, that you can correct the mechanical issue, but it doesn't always take care of the pain itself. So the the ongoing follow up of these patients is is crucial that you can you can bring bring that to bear on that. Yeah, in terms of the longer term future for this patient, uh, hopefully uh, mm -hmm. the, the the spinal cord stimulator makes a difference. What else would you plan to do on her apart from the fact that we know the the stent has stayed open? Uh, that that's a really good question. The one thing that when I think back to when I initially saw her. Her, her request first off was, can I have an amputation? And what we've managed to do with her in this particular case is that we've managed to control the tissue loss, managed to control the swelling. And yes, she has a bit of discomfort, which will be uh, ultimately managed by our expert pain team. But we've preserved that functional limb in her case and ha have avoided that request that she had for us, to, which was for us to take the leg away. She's now able to use it. It's a functional limb for her. She's able to weight, weight bear on it. And uh, though she's not back at the zoo now, she's quite uh, actively involved in employment uh, in HR. Right. Okay. So, you know, I think I think a great message for everyone is is venous disease uh, can sometimes lead to limb threatening conditions. Um, uh, you know, not as commonly as arterial disease, but in both these. <laughs> two patients that we've seen in the retrospective today, uh, the interventions here have preserved limbs and got patients back to a level of function that, that has kept them active in life. And I think that's uh, ultimately what we're trying to achieve. So thank you very much, Taha, for your, for your time. That was great. And we look forward to seeing more excellent cases at BO 2023. Thank you very much.